Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you today in here in this very special afternoon at Ed America for the public lecture, Creating Social Impact. I'm, uh, as introduced, I'm your host, Ardelia Turfa, and I'm excited to be here today. This event has been organized to bring together experts and scholars to share their knowledge and ideas on the topic of social entrepreneurship. We are honored to have three exceptional individuals with us today, each with unique and valuable perspectives to share. Before I introduce our speakers for today, I would like to greet and welcome first uh, Mrs. Pepe, our Acting Dean of, of PPM School of Management. Welcome, Ibu. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, and okay, without further ado, let me introduce you to our first speaker of the day. Mrs. Anggun Pesona Intan is a lecturer from PPM School of Management, founder of Terminal Hujan and expert associate of Platform Usaha Social. Mrs. Anggun today will be sharing her insights on the landscape of social enterprise in Indonesia. Uh, I'll be inviting. Please welcome Mrs. Anggun Pesona Intan to the stage. For the next one, our second speaker, uh, coming all the way from America, Dr. Teresa Shaheen, Senior Lecturer in Social Entrepreneurship, Yale University, Fulbright Specialist, and also the author of Social Entrepreneurship, Building Impact Step by Step. I welcome Dr. Teresa to on the stage, please. And the last speaker, we have Afrodita Indayana, co-founder and business development PT Eka Wisata Creative Indonesia, and also a business development at coffeewaste.id, a social enterprise that has concern for waste disposal management in coffee shop. For Mr. Afrodita, I welcome you to the stage. So we have all of our speakers on the stage already, and before we start, uh, we will have a quick Mentimeter session. So please take out your phones, tablets, or any uh, devices that you have on hands right now and go to Mentimeter.com. Uh, for the operator, can you please show the Mentimeter code? So everyone can open the Mentimeter.com. On the, on the phone and add the code that is shown on the screen. The code for the Mentimeter is 4589627888. We will have a quick session for an breaking. And the first question for the Mentimeter is, describe social entrepreneurship in three words. Please type down anything that pops up in your mind as you hear about, as you uh, be reminded of social entrepreneurship. Okay, we have kindness, innovative, impact. Voluntary, that's a nice one. Empowering, art, Creativity, sustainability, impactful, okay, sustainable is a popular word today, solidarity, non-profit, yes, green sustain, circular, oh wow, there's a lot of words, <laughs> people are excited for our discussion today. Okay, small business, okay. helping, yeah, okay, I think everyone is already involved since the beginning, we will move on to our next question, okay, what social problems do you care the most and want to do something about, so you can type down a certain social problem that has intrigued you and uh, you are interested in and actually encourages you to do something to help that problem. You can type down the anything, just the topic or just the problem in general.
education, poverty, oh, stunting, climate change, health, waste. Waste will be one of our main discussion today. Okay, workers' exploitation, that's a nice one. Health quality, infrastructure, women empowerment, children rights, oh, fast fashion issue, interesting, social cohesion, biodiversity, ocean creature. Okay. okay, let's see what we what we will be discussing today with all our all of our amazing speakers. I think the Mentimeter session is enough for today. And thank you for your responses and your participation in our Mentimeter session. Okay, without further ado, we will start our presentation session for the day. Uh, without further ado, I will be inviting Mrs. Angun Pesonaintan to start her presentation. For Mrs. Angun, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Ardelia. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm not going to lecture you about... I know, like the... Can you please... <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm not... Sorry. I'm not going to lecture you about the landscape of the social entrepreneurship in Indonesia. It's kind of scary to talk about it in this Friday afternoon. <laughs> So maybe we can talk like more into a very casual way. I want to share about something that I know that I'm still learning of. Let's start. But beforehand, I want to share to you about my experience with the YCLE uh, PFP. It's Young Southeast Asian Leadership Initiatives. It's a really uh, a very meaningful, meaningful activities that happened to me in 2019. So I passed and I was a delegate from Indonesia to go to have a follow fellowship, professional fellowship in Chicago for one and a half month. And it changed my whole life. Oh my God, it's, it's too exaggerating, yeah? But uh, I, I found it very useful that because the activity has shaped me into what I am today and what I want to learn from. So be, uh, I spent one and a half uh, months in Chicago working with an organization named My Block, My Hood, My City, or the M3 is an NGO that work and based in Chicago and that has main work to advocate the rights and to empower youth for, from underserved community, from the black community, I'm sorry, African-American community, as well as the Hispanic community. So it was really, really meaningful to me. And also in 2017, I went to Japan. I got a scholarship as well, and I was a delegate to visit and to learn about sustainability. That is why. I'm more aware about it, but I'm still learning about it because uh, it's kind of a very big uh, pond, big pool that has so many actors and different ecosystems that really interesting to learn from. And of course, you are already aware of the SDG goals. This is, and this were created by the global community and agreed upon the, uh, by the world leaders. I heard from the Ministry of uh, National Planning that Indonesia has passed 60% of reaching SDGs goals, and it's really, in, yeah, it's really an achievement from uh, for Indonesia. But I know that you know all by screening from the environment, also from your nearest neighborhood, all the problems are still there. Some of the problem, oh. I forgot to tell you about the social enterprises that I bumped into when I was in Chicago. It named Chicago Furniture Bank. It is really interesting. Before it was a project from the student of University of Pennsylvania, but now it became bigger. So I emailed Griffin, one of the founder, to had, can you can you have a coffee a cup of coffee with me? I want to hear more stories about Chicago Furniture Bank. So the mission is basically to provide and being an intermediary from Chicagoans who have uh, excessive uh, furniture and then they will have it refurbished and furnished and will deliver it to the people who really need it. So it's, it's really uh, it's very interesting to see. Now it comes bigger and uh, the last time, uh, oh, this is, this is Griffith. Griffin, this is the Griffin, the 
he was dreaming to build this into a bigger one and now all the founders as i'm not if i'm not mistaken already stepping away from the day-to-day uh, -day operations because the organization getting bigger and it's so interesting to see the story and to hear the stories and in indonesia itself so many and some of you already stated from the mentimeter that we have so many problems that you see in every days and daily basis for example the fast fashion one or the waste management system one even the inequalities or for example natural disaster teenage juvenile you can name it even criminality that happens and appears in your virtual world from social media it keeps happening criminality like people i always thinking that why is people getting easily in stabbing person in killing person when they just like doesn't uh, feel all right or they are like feeling jealousy something like that it's really happening now so i'm not really running into the figures because the number would be very very <laughs> saddening so while all many people maybe some of you already started a social venture or maybe some of you already being a social activism you try to raising awareness on what issues that you are care uh, most of on this on the other side business also play a bigger role big business also play a bigger role you you must be aware of the csr strategy for example maybe social impact that the state-owned company or even private sectors do it but it always comes to my mind personally can actually business we can do business while contributing to society can be also in we can wrap it into one activities or into one business model actually you can because there is a concept named social entrepreneurship i cited from my favorite book from dr shahin's book and the author is sitting next to next to me right now <laughs> thank you so actually social entrepreneurship is the act of pioneering new method processes products and services that address social and environmental challenges through the creations of new organizations or initiatives so you use the entrepreneurial mindset you use the entrepreneurial uh, business model for example to solve uh, the challenges in social or environmental uh, or even education problems based on the table that i put here we can really see what is the difference between social entrepreneurship and commercial entrepreneurship while social entrepreneurship really tackles the market valor commercial entrepreneurship responds to a market opportunity and social entrepreneurship really target the social impacts while commercial entrepreneurship see financial profits as a bottom line and social entrepreneurship itself is actually a very uh, broad spectrum you can see from the non-profits 100 social causes to 100 commercials you can do it with hybrid models non-profits model or even for profits models it become into a social entrepreneurship family so it's really a diverse universe and this is the research that i got from plus plus is actually a, a social enterprise enabler so they often make a research even make a programs for social entrepreneurs when they have uh, when they need to have a thinking partner so this is actually the social enterprise ecosystem in indonesia when we have that we have enablers consists of incubators accelerators capacity builders as well as ecosystem builders we have also the impact investors and financiers impact investment you can name it venture capital peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms crowdfunding platforms also in social enterprise ecosystem we have the policy maker government bodies and agencies as well as business support in terms of legal advisory accounting platform and hr platform and also the media through the tv shows now this is one of my favorite uh, products that is uh, there is apparently a social entrepreneur enterprise so meet ibu helianti hilman from jafara she is the founder and also the ceo of jafara jafara helps to empower smallholder farmers and food artisans in villages to achieve better quality of life by bringing back <laughs> forgotten indonesia's food biodiversity to the market so they don't have factories they don't have a set 
they assess are the community itself. So they, so she goes to remote area in Indonesia, try to cultivate working with the small hardest farmers to really bringing back their very high quality product to the market, mostly to the exports market. And now they have been exporting to, they have been exporting to more than 34 countries in the world. So cool. Ibu Helianti is so cool. We met them also with Teresa and some of PPM students as well as the lecturers. And now we also uh, have you have you heard about Sukacita? Can you raise your hand if you have ever uh, ever heard Sukacita? Sukacita. Okay. <laughs> we can we can we can see the video. We can watch the video. It's Denicha. Denicha is the uh, founder of Sukacita. Sukacita is one of the B Corp, B certified corporations. It means they have met the highest standard of environmental and social impact. And it's an award-winning products, and it's really cool. They help to empower craft women's economy in villages to achieve better quality of life by producing and marketing sustainable handmade clothes. I think I prepared some of the video. Can it be played? maybe there is some problems with the network so Gajita has never been about fashion we don't do seasons we're not fast we're here because we see a need for change and we want to invite you to be part of it. I'm not a designer. As a development consultant, I returned to Indonesia to create impact. But beyond all the boardroom meetings and reports, it didn't feel like what I was doing was making any difference. So in 2015, I started doing my own research. Going village to village, it was the first time I saw what goes behind some of the things we use every day. Women making clothes with their hands. Skills and tradition passed down mothers to daughters. It's beautiful, but I couldn't help but notice the struggling. I had to realize that behind a simple choice like what we wear every day are women who will never meet, hands will never see, and struggle will never know because of an unfair system. And my heart was broken. Craft is not just about pretty things. It really matters because it provides work for millions of men and women working from home. The thing is, the industry practice is really dirty. Environmentally, because of thousands of tons of toxic dyes entering our waterways each year. Socially, because only a small group of middlemen and workshop owners make all the profits. The problem is that for people like you and me, we just don't know. <laughs> Sukajita was created to change that. A bridge to bring you and the artisans closer. That's why we work directly with villagers, not factories. Because this is where most of our artisans live and work. Yet, without any access, they often live a life of poverty. So through continuous trainings, we give them the tools to change their own lives. From business skills 
to environmentally friendly practices and quality management. It takes time, but for us, it's the only way. Started with only three women, we now empower more than 100 artisans. With our craft schools, we want to reach 1,000 more over the next five years. Made Right is our transparency standard. It's a promise that everything we make pays a living wage, is kind to the earth, and uses heritage craft. Every time you choose Made Right, you contribute to end pollution and exploitation. You know exactly where and who made your clothes and the impact it had on someone's life. Sukachita means happiness in Indonesian. It embodies our mission to return pride to those who have been invisible for too long. Okay, great. So for those who already mentioned about the fast fashion, <laughs> so you have to at least have one of Sukachita's clothes. You can find it in, in Ashta district malls. <laughs> okay, so um, after going back and backwards, because uh, besides I am a lecturer myself, I also built my own project with uh, some of my friends back to back in 2011. So it's it has been running for over 10 years already. So this is um, this uh, the NGO that is called Yayasan Terminal Hujan that I want to share about the stories more about you because we are still having a challenges that maybe the challenges I can share to you instead of the success stories so it can really help you when you want to build some of social ventures. Actually, when we started it in 2011, we wanted to help children to succeed at least a nine-year compulsory formal education in slum areas to have better job opportunities by assisting children on reading, writing, math, and soft skill development. So we have, we hope that it can give them like more energy at least to finish the nine-year compulsory uh, schools. So we started by uh, three, 30 children, 20 children, and now we have more than 150 students in every, every week. But we think, we think that it, it's not enough at all. Because why? <laughs> because we already, we only meet them one, uh, once in a week. It means the impact that we give will not be enough to ensure that they will continue the school. We give them scholarship and etc. But we think that it's, it's just not enough. After that, after le uh, re uh, learning from so many sources, asking, doing product iterations, we think that we need to empower the whole community, so the whole kampung. So building a kampung wisata or tourist village in urban village in Bogor is coming to our mind. So this is the neighborhood, the kampung, that where all the children uh, live. They live alongside the Chiliwung River. Now it's getting better, the Chiliwung, because it's so much cleaner. I started it with the CSR funding. And it's really okay if you want to build your social venture and you start it with CSR. Maybe with Sukachita or maybe uh, you have the investors or maybe you are fully uh, relying on grants. It's really okay. So I started uh, the project with the CSR uh, from a company. So in term, uh, because we always see that Kampung Wisata or Desa Wisata always have so many beautiful resources. You can find the rice field, very nice one, the very clean river. You can stay over, sleep over at one of the local people's houses. But for Kampung that sit in, lays in the city, you don't have that kind of privilege. They just live in the small alleys and very um, minimum standard of hygiene. So that is just the, you know, like the given, the given example, the given and the given uh, stated situation. That is why we think that all the resources are coming from the human resources itself. They have so many youth as local people because they are our students. So we try to create a festivals in which Visitors can visit the valley, the valley and explore the valley just like a labyrinth. 
That's why it's named Kampung Labirin. Maybe you will get a surprise in one valley. You will get to see uh, young people trying to dance, dancing a Sundanese traditional dance. Or maybe you get to see uh, many of them are drop out mostly, playing the stomp music or traditional angklung one. Even you can taste uh, the local mom's uh, cuisines, food, and you can enjoy that alongside the Chilwung River. It's the first. It's the first idea, and, and it has been running now for over four years. But now, 90%, almost 100% of the operations are done by the local people. And the government, local government, already take care of them and give them more training. So, uh, but still, we have so many challenges. So many, some of the challenges that I've been experiencing, we are experiencing right now, is one, is to continue. Are we going to continue with this kind of product or we have to pivot, for example? We have to change the unique selling points. We need to change the products because we are struggling also with the visitors. Are really visitors coming to the village because they want to see the village or they put pity on us <laughs> because they think it could be nice to just donate to local people? We have to think about it. And also, we need to think about the next steps, what is the improvement for the kampung itself. And also, this has been always the uh, problem for us is the local people participation, uh, participation issues. Of course, in one kampung, we have 500 inhabitants and it's really difficult to mobilize all of them. So it's become more and more complicated until now. It's, the some, ch uh, it's some challenges, but more local people and some of them, many of them are still trying to figure out how to do things and they don't want to give up. And I think it's the only matter to us. All right, it's done. Okay, thank you very much. I'm passing it back to Ardelia. Thank you, Mrs. Anggun, such an interesting insight for the social entrepreneurship, especially from the Indonesian perspective. So to balance out for the next session, we will be hearing from Dr. Teresa Shaheen uh, more into the global perspective for the Dr. Teresa. We will come to the stage. Thank you. Do I get a clicker too? Do I get a clicker? Oh, sorry. Oh, thanks. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting us here. And thank you to Angoon for getting us started by discussing her journey as an Indonesian youth, how she got to visit other countries, learn about different social enterprise initiatives, and then come back and start her own initiative in education and in community development. And I think that it's very appropriate that you stop um, by sharing, that you ended by sharing the challenges because it's very easy to tell success stories and to make beautiful videos about how you're fixing everything and solving everything. But really what social entrepreneurs face every day is a lot of challenges. So whether you're here with us in person or watching on your phone or your laptop, I hope that our discussions and our stories today can help you learn from people who have attempted social initiatives before you and encourage you that it's good to try and it's good to mobilize any resources available to you including yourself your own knowledge and your network and the communities around you csr universities private sector all we can do is try to work together to improve societal well-being and so just like angun has done that here in indonesia and afro who's going to share his work with us after I'm going to share with you some general frameworks about social entrepreneurship and some examples from around the world to help inform and inspire your work. So I am based at Yale University in the US at the School of Management where we have a program on entrepreneurship. And my training is in public health originally. And I come from Lebanon, a country that has its own challenges, both the geopolitical situation, a high number of refugees, like one in every four people is a refugee, a lot of environmental, social, and economic problems. And I got interested in social entrepreneurship because I felt that my academic training wasn't enough for me to contribute to changing the world. I wanted to do something where I could see the impact of my work. And so I define social entrepreneurship as the process by which innovative, 
effective and sustainable solutions are pioneered to meet social and environmental needs. So it doesn't have to mean starting something new. It can even mean that as a student, as a volunteer, or as an employee in any organization, you look at the world around you, question why things are the way they are today, and ask yourself how you might do something differently to improve society. That's it. And so a social entrepreneur is someone who designs and implements an intervention, a product, a service, anything new, even if it's within an old organization, to improve the well-being of society. So if you want to work in social entrepreneurship, what skills do you need? It's a combination of management skills and social sciences. So management skills include building organizational structure, business planning, accounting, marketing, all those types of things that you would need to work in any organization. And then from the social sciences, to me this is the hardest part, is understanding the problem, formulating evidence-driven solutions, and talking to people who have experienced the challenge you're working with and who are trying to solve it. I wanted to mention one of the people that helped me learn a lot about social entrepreneurship, who's Bill Drayton, the founder of Ashoka, an organization based in Washington, D.C. that supports social entrepreneurs. And he describes a vision he has of a world where everyone is a change maker. So every single person sitting in this audience, including Angun's baby, who just got here a while ago, and every single person watching online there's something you can do to create a change. It doesn't have to be an enormous change. It doesn't have to be highly profitable. It doesn't have to be a charity case. It could be anything in between. But whatever situation you're in, you can find a way to do things differently. And he calls it a new paradigm and a new mindset of a change maker. He sees a world where everyone is a change maker. And creating change maker communities just like Kampun Labyrinth everywhere. By the way, I did get to visit Kampun Labyrinth, and I did get to taste the really good food made by the moms there and the tasty snacks like mochi with peanut inside. And I met the youth, including children playing music, traditional instruments, uh, traditional dance, and what else? We saw the river. <laughs> so Angun's been taking me around and visiting lots of social enterprises in Jakarta. And it really takes an ecosystem to raise a change maker. So I've been visiting the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Jakarta, which includes the social enterprises, the funders, the universities and training programs, and the incubators and ecosystem enablers. So there's so many players. And you might end up working in one of these different types of institutions, whether you're designing the initiative, funding it, supporting it, doing research with it. There's so many different roles you can play, depending on your talents, your interests, and the roles that you see yourself playing. So not everyone has to be a CEO that gets interviewed and makes videos and shares their vision. Some people prefer to be behind the scenes doing technical work, coding, program design, etc. Some people want to do the finance, the communications, so there is a right fit for you, whatever your interests and talents are. The way I teach social entrepreneurship in my book, which Angun contributed to, and also in the university where I work, is 10 stages of social entrepreneurship. And it's not a linear path. It's very iterative. So it's not that you proceed from stage one until stage 10. You're always going back and forth between the different stages. And the, f oh, I thought I made a list of the stages. <laughs> so I'll just keep it on the slide. So the first stage is understanding the problem. What is the problem that you wish you could change? What is the social or environmental challenge? So you all shared many challenges that you care about, including climate, poverty, women's empowerment, children's rights, health, um, crime, so many different things understanding what are the root causes, who are the people affected, and what has been tried before, what has worked and what hasn't. Because you're not the first person to care about this problem, and you're not the first person to have an idea about how you can change it. So it's important 
for you to know that you don't need to start from scratch. You can build on what others have done before you, and you need to be armed with data and knowledge about why this persists. It, this problem is still here because it's a very complicated issue. So the first step is to identify what you want to work on and do as much research as you can about it by reading online and finding out what other research people have done. And the second step is talking to people. Actually email and message and go meet with people who are working on this problem, who are affected by it. Go to where the problem is. If you care about waste management, like garbage, literally go where the garbage is. If you care about uh, any problem, find it and go engage with it. Talk to people who are affected by it and who are working on it. Because your desk research is only the first step to make you informed. And the second step is to get out there and engage with the problem and talk to people. Then the third step is to talk, while continuing to talk with these people, not on your own, to tr start designing an offering. I use the word offering instead of a solution because nothing any one person or any group of people designs is going to solve these really complicated problems. But it's a contribution that you can offer in order to make some kind of improvement. So depending on what you learn through your conversations and your experience and what resources you have access to, you can design a contribution. And most importantly, think about how you would implement that in collaboration with others, because social entrepreneurship is about collective action. Once you come up with your idea, then you need to develop it further by continuing to talk to as many people as you can about your idea and figuring out what would it take for it to fail? What would it take for it to succeed? How is it going to change over time? And what you end up implementing is usually very, very, very different from what you start. So the idea will evolve over time. And it's important to find ways to test it in a very low cost, um, low time way. So we call it fail fast, like just make an experiment that you can use to collect data from potential customers and others to figure out how and why and when people would be interested in engaging with your offering. After that, the next step is defining what would success look like? What do I want to happen in 5, 10, 20 years? And how will I measure that? Because the interesting thing about social entrepreneurship is that the bottom line is social change. So in commercial entrepreneurship, you know you're successful if you make a lot of money, you cover your costs, you generate surplus, and that surplus is distributed as profit to the investors and the funders and the team. In social entrepreneurship, I think Angun's daughter agrees with me. I hear her saying, yeah. <laughs> so in social entrepreneurship, the bottom line is the social change you're creating, and you need to understand how to measure and capture that. And maybe we can talk about it in the Q&A because it's one of the most challenging aspects of social entrepreneurship is really communicating the success metric. Now, finally, halfway through the 10 stages of social entrepreneurship, we can start to talk about money. And I did this on purpose because I think it's important to first identify your impact model and then you can identify your revenue model. The revenue is a means to an end. It's not an end in and of itself. That doesn't mean you have to be a charity case. Many social entrepreneurs are self-sustaining and do generate surplus, and then they decide how they're going to reinvest their surplus, either by distributing profit to the team, the founders and investors, or by reinvesting part or all of the surplus in the social change that they're working to create. And there are many interesting revenue models that are common in social entrepreneurship that I'll try to give a couple of examples about and we can also discuss in the Q&A. And then other steps are thinking about how you're going to finance your initiative. There is a whole spectrum of social financing approaches, including grant-making organizations, venture capital, and something in between called venture philanthropy, as well as impact investing, where you're generating social impact and financial return on investment. And lastly, thinking about how you're going to organize this initiative? Are you going to structure a new organization? Are you going to launch within an existing organization? And how will you communicate it? Learning the skills that it takes to pitch your ideas and communicate your business plan. 
And finally, we talk about cementing and expanding your impact. And that means that your initiative can't change everything. Like the fashion initiative we watched the video of. Okay, so now they're reaching 100 women, and in five years, they're going to reach 1,000 women. And then what? There are millions of women. So part of your impact is in the direct service that you provide and in scaling that direct service. But another part is also about changing that system that's broken and influencing others to do things differently. So how can you use your work as a platform for legislation, policy change, advocacy, and most importantly, working with others because social entrepreneurship is about collective change. And it's all in the context of sustainable development where we're trying to create economic along with social and environmental goals. Many of you have heard about the sustainable development goals that Angun shared, but you might not know that this is like V2.0. When I graduated from college, it was the year 2000. I know that many of you weren't born yet, but the point is that when the turn of the millennium came, the human race said, hey, this is, you know, it's the new millennium and we still have poverty, we still have women dying in childbirth, we still have children not going to school, we still have so many diseases. We're gonna end all these problems by 2015. And the Millennium Development Goals was the global agenda that set these ambitious targets by 2015. We're gonna eradicate poverty, no hunger, no <laughs> disease. So, you know, like, I'm sure I'm not ruining the, the movie for you. Um, this didn't happen. Spoiler alert, that's when we made the Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, so it didn't work out so well by 2015, but now we're really gonna do it by 2030. Okay, now we're halfway through that, right? Like it just, now we're like 7.5 years into that and it's 2023. So I don't know about you, but I'm not feeling very confident we're gonna reach these goals in an, another 7.5 years. Um, the evidence shows that at the current rate, we're more likely to achieve the goals by 2080. I'm not saying this to depress you. I'm saying this to activate you. Because the only way we're gonna reach the sustainable development goals is if every single person on the planet gets involved. And if that happens, we can absolutely achieve them. Again, you don't have to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. You just have to ask yourself, what is one small thing that I can do? And I'm sure you noticed that the last goal is partnership for the goals which means you don't have to do it alone, and in fact, you can't do it alone. We can only do it by working together. Because even if and when we eradicate all these challenges, a whole new set of challenges will emerge. So we have to build the infrastructure and the partnerships to work together across sectors to face these challenges. So I'll share with you a couple of examples from around the world. I won't have time to go through them all, so let me scroll through and think which ones I want to focus on. Um, I'll start with the daily table because I know it's Angun's favorite. So let me go ahead and start with something about the US since we saw a few examples from Indonesia. So daily table was founded by uh, the former president of Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's is kind of like Tesco or one of these like national supermarkets. What would be an example from Jakarta? What would be something similar? Hero, Transmart maybe? There you Hyper. go. So it's just a regular supermarket. And this person, Doug Rao, was the president for like 30 years. And he noticed there was so much uh, fresh produce being wasted, like 30% of, of, um, of food is wasted in the US or more. A lot of, the, some of this happens in the household. Some of it happens at the retail centers. So for example, when I buy an apple at Trader Joe's, the person at the checkout says, oh, look, there's a bruise on the apple. You wanna go pick another one? I'm like, no, dude, I picked this apple. Just let me pay for it. But the point is there's like, they have to try to make everything look perfect. Otherwise they throw it away. And that is a huge environmental disaster. And it's also a social disaster because another problem they're facing in the US and especially in urban areas is that there is not access to healthy food for low-income communities. They call it a food apartheid, where there's nutritional injustice. And poverty in the US doesn't look like in the last millennium wh where people are wasting away. It looks the opposite of obesity. Because if you only have a few dollars to feed your family, you can't afford to buy fresh fruits and vegetables and make meals. 
you can only afford to go to fast food where you can buy as much calories for as little money as possible, and then creating unhealthy systems in the body, creating food addiction. And this goes back to root causes, including policies that started decades ago to subsidize high fructose corn syrup, keep farmers working in World War II. So there are very historical, sticky root causes to tackle on a policy level. But in the meantime, Doug Rao found this solution that was more logistical and supply chain and saying like, hey, what if instead of throwing away all this wasted food, we can start a new supermarket where our procurement costs are zero. So we get the wasted food donated from the supermarkets and we sell it in the urban settings where there is no fresh fruits and vegetables. That was his first business plan. Unfortunately, it didn't go very well. Remember what I told you, the first idea is never the one you implement. Because all of a sudden, people started reporting on him online about like, former president of Trader Joe's is trying to sell people's trash to poor people. He's trying to like sell people you know, unwanted food, which was totally untrue, but sometimes social media works against you. So his first idea was not acceptable to the community. And there were misperceptions about it. So he iterated his business idea and he kept thinking about how he can change. And at the end of the day, he found a solution was, which was to go to the wholesalers that sell to the big chains like Costco and Walmart where people go um, buy low cost food. And he would go at like 9 a.m. after the big supermarkets bought their food and he would buy whatever was left for really, really cheap. So he was still able to sell it for very low cost. But that wasn't even enough because he realized poverty is not just lack of money, it's lack of time and lack of knowledge. You can't just sell raw ingredients to a working mother who has two jobs and has to open the door and have food on the table immediately when she gets home at 6 p.m. There's also the importance of convenience. So he hired a chef from the neighborhood to prepare pre-prepared meals that could be sold at a low cost. So it was this whole process of talking to people, iterating the model, starting from scratch, finding how you're going to make the social impact and how you're going to make the financial viability that made it work. And so, as Angoon mentioned, social entrepreneurship is a spectrum that spans everything in between traditional charity and traditional commerce. And there are so many users and players in the ecosystem, including the customers, the innovators, the regulators, the funders, and the enablers. And so if you want to learn more, I invite you to check out my podcast, which is called Impact and Innovation. And it's found wherever you find your podcasts on multiple platforms. And I invite you to visit socialentrepreneurshipbook.com, where you can not only watch videos and listen to the podcast, you can also read articles that I've written about this topic. And you can learn about a new free online course that's launching in 2023 where I talk more about the, these 10 stages and I walk you through a journey where you pick a topic just for practice, just to have a safe space to fail, or you might implement it and you go through the 10 stages with me and we take that journey together. So I would love if you would check out one or more of these resources. If you'd like to learn more about my work, there's also a documentary called sufrafilm.com which chronicles one of the social ventures I supported in Lebanon. And I'll end with the idea that, you know what? There is money in this world, and there are ideas. And it's all about piecing together the different pieces of the puzzle. You don't have to find a, a new idea or have a eureka moment out of thin air. You just think about what are the existing stakeholders and how can you put them together in a new way. And the question is, how will you contribute? If all these people from around the world, including Indonesia and the US and India and Lebanon and so many countries have found a way to do it, then so can you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Teresa, for um, another eye-opener sharing. OK, before we go to our talk show session, we have one last speaker to share with us today. I welcome Mr. Afrodita to share with us. But your the state is yours. Okay. 
maybe I will. Uh, I'm the one of the speaker who speak with Indonesia. It's okay, yeah? okay, okay. Karena saya cuma bisa tiga bahasa, jadi satu bahasa Indonesia, dua Jawa, ketiga sedikit Sunda. Jadi <laughs> Inggrisnya ini masih kayaknya belum lulus-lulus banget nih di Ayuf. Oke. Okay. Oh. Terima kasih untuk teman-teman di sini yang udah hadir. Ini adalah uh, kedua kalinya saya ada di Et Amerika. Dulu saya belajar uh, pertama di sini untuk project after mining dari YCLI juga. Nah, ini akan share juga. Jadi sebelum uh, kita cerita tentang apapun yang sudah dilakukan tadi sudah uh, teori teorikalnya dan lain sebagainya, saya akan cerita bahwa sebenarnya action with vacation tuh possible gak sih dan lain sebagainya. Dan ternyata bisa. Kenapa tiba-tiba ada problem ini, saya ambil contoh ini adalah kita lihat sekarang orang-orang kalau liburan itu semuanya something wild aja, crazy aja jadi. Jadi datang ke tempat, suatu tempat itu bawa, sorry to say, beberapa orang itu ketika liburan itu bukan cuma bawa sampah fisik tapi bawa sampah psikis karena udah pusing. Ke tempat wisata itu dia udah lari-larian bawa, gak bawa dan itu sangat annoying gitu di beberapa tempat. Dan kita nggak pernah sadar tentang itu. Kita pernah mikirkan nggak di, di lokal itu uh, sekeberisikan apa gitu, se, seterganggu apa. So, itu yang pertama akan kita bahas. Sebelumnya juga saya akan cerita lebih banyak tentang Ecotiva. Memang saya aktif di beberapa hal, coffee ways, kemudian after mining, nilai sebagainya. Ecotiva adalah suatu platform usaha yang saya buat bersama Mas Bagus ada di sana. Yeah. This is the man who make our business is always stable. Kalau saya adalah orang yang berusaha membuat bisnis ini, selalu utopian gitu, jadi dia remnya, jadi gimana caranya tetap uh, punya dampak tapi tetap punya hasil. Kalau tadi start dari bisnis sama, uh, tapi ini kita nggak bermikir, nggak usah pusing-pusing, kita mikir uh, problemnya itu dari mana dan lain sebagainya. Semuanya kembali dari problem personal, di mana yang pertama saya sekolah di ekowisata IPB, di tahun 2010-2013, siapa yang tahu kalau ada pertanyaan orang tua, Nanti di ekowisata lulus jadi apa? Gak ada yang pernah tahu. Gak pernah tahu. Jadi kami berusaha menjawab pertanyaan kami sendiri tentang implementasi edukasional kami. Kalau untuk jurusan-jurusan uh, yang sangat spesifik itu saya mungkin akan susah. Tapi kalau general itu mungkin akan mudah. Yang kedua adalah low positive impact in vacation. Bukan yang gak ada impact. Ada. Tapi mungkin kecil. Tapi mungkin negatif juga. Nah ini yang kita akan coba buat. Dan yang paling unik adalah kita, Indonesia, itu punya momen di mana setiap setelah belajar, setiap setelah SD, SMP, SMA belajar, itu ada namanya study tour. Betul ya? Siapa yang study tournya beneran study? Ini bener-bener permasalahan yang akhirnya kita nggak pernah tahu hari ini mungkin panennya. Ketika di study tour ya teman-teman bebas, too much tolerance aja. Jadi terlalu banyak toleransi bebas ya udah liburan liburan aja tapi ya nggak usah pakai nama study tour sebenarnya bisa mungkin study tour atau yang lain gitu itu yang membuat kami membuat suatu program dan kami memutuskan untuk bisa lo do more action with vacation gitu dan ini kita mengajak setiap ke tempat wisata ya sedikitnya bikin aksi sedikit yang positif itu akan menimbulkan satu hal good impression kesan baik dan testimonial yang itu akan memicu trigger teman-teman di lapangan untuk berbuat lebih bagus lagi. Nah, Ecotiva ini kita ada di 2018, jadi masih baru. Dua tahun setelahnya ternyata pandemi, ya kan? Tapi kita sudah melakukan banyak kebetulan banyak project. Meskipun ini 2018 Ecotivanya, tapi sebelumnya kita sudah mulai dari 2008 Mas Bagus buat EFTO namanya, Ecotourism Field Trip Organizing, tapi as a CV hanya study tour aja. Kemudian Ketemulah dengan YCLI yang membuka diri kita buat, oh bisa nih uh, melakukan banyak hal. Problemnya ketika di lapangan ternyata banyak destinasi itu sudah dapat pendampingan tapi nggak ngajarin cara jualan. Jadi paketnya nggak meet, nggak, nggak match. Ketika teman-teman belajar di manajemen operasi dan kemudian di lapangan di masyarakat itu ada masalah, ya bisanya cuma komplain. Nggak membuat mas, uh, masyarakat itu punya apa hal baru yang kemudian konstruktif gitu usulannya nggak ada jadi kalau kita nih liburan ke desa wisata kemudian hal ada hal terjadi nggak baik saya yakin kita cuman komplain ada yang mau nggak yang 
oh, kayaknya nggak gini deh caranya ngajarin. Itu nggak ada. Jadi kita berusaha pengen membuat itu semuanya hulu hilir. Apakah ini possible? Dalam dulu kita sudah sejauh ini berjalan dan ya meskipun susah jadi dan ini takes time banget. Takes time. Oke lanjut. Uh, ini milestones kita. Jadi mulai dari awal kita memang berangkat dari community sosial. Mas Bagus buat namanya Saung Guide. Dimana untuk ya teman-teman yang sekolah itu terakomodir. Minimal menjadi guide. Kemudian berani membuat suatu program dan kemudian suatu usaha. Efto tapi masih B2B market, jadi masih di sekolah dengan corporate dan lain sebagainya. Kemudian 2015 mulai bikin program. Bedanya adalah kalau study tour itu ya study tour, nggak ada program yang basis activity-nya nggak ada. Jadi kita hanya connecting the vendor, benar ya, organizer cuman gitu ya. Tapi kita coba berani bikin fitur baru untuk mengcreate masyarakat punya aktivitas dan kemudian punya layanan nilai jual kita beli. Mulai dari sini. Kemudian 2017 saya dikontak almarhum Ricky Sudiarto kebetulan sudah uh, dahulu kemudian dia punya program namanya after mining itu diimplementasikan di Bojonegoro di Wonocolo gimana membuat suatu kawasan yang tadinya itu kawasan tambang tradisional yang enggak uh, apa ya nggak bisa dimasukin dan lain sebagainya dan ben- mungkin setahun dua tahun itu selesai masyarakat akan nggak punya uh, apa namanya ya mata pencarian lagi dan Kita semua mencoba masuk ke sana bersama Mas Riki, Mas Udin, Mbak Ranitia Nurlita, dan saya mencoba membuat suatu konsep di mana masyarakat agar mempunyai sebuah uh, opsi pendapatan baru. Dan nanti akan kita lihat hasilnya. Kemudian 2019 baru kita buat yang namanya PT. Dengan konsep bisnis fundingnya yang baru. Kalau dulu kita cuman dari, ya udah uh, kita tawarkan aja program. Sekarang kita... berani mengajukan ke government, kemudian ke CSR, karena saya belajar juga dari Mbak Anggun, gimana membuat, oh CSR, dulu kita nggak tahu bahwa ada yang namanya grant atau hibah. Kita cuma tahu, semua yang kita lakukan di desa, semua kita lakukan di lapangan, kita ajarin, masukin RAB, tawarkan ke klien. Harganya akan besar, mau nggak mau. Tapi Alhamdulillah itu sudah beberapa program sudah jadi kurikulum di beberapa sekolah. Dan 2021 saya membuat sebuah program namanya Back Heritage di Bogor, jadi kalau main ke Bogor, sudah ada opsi aktivitas kita bersepeda ke tempat-tempat heritage di Bogor dan hari ini dengan waktu yang sama sedang di launching menjadi official program tourism di Bogor hari ini sama persis oleh Kang Bima Arya dan semuanya dan 2021 uh, tadi kita itu B2C ya ternyata B2C susah banget ya jadi harus kuat di sosial media dan lain sebagainya convert ini sangat susah sekali kita berharap 2020 bisa jadi integrated sustainable tourism itu jadi mulai dari hulu sampai ke hilir semuanya sistemnya sudah jadi sampai hari ini kita bergantian aja ya mas bagus ya jadi yang sekarang kita mengerjakan program development dulu yang kemudian de- perencanaan destinasi kemudian jualan ini nggak bisa berjalan bareng harusnya ini berjalan bareng oke okay? ini produk core kita jadi ada destination management system dan visitor management system kita bagi Ada uh, tourism destination, kemudian consultant and creator special interest. Ini most valuable produk kita. Yang terakhir operator seperti biasa. Dan ini yang sudah kita lakukan. Jadi kita melakukan yang tadi dibilang ke Anggun dan uh, Bu Teresa di mana enabler. Kita bikin reset, kita bikin ini sendiri semuanya tanpa dibayar. Dan kemudian baru membuatkan produk. Nah, apa yang sudah dilakukan? Kebetulan akhirnya banyak program yang sudah kita buat yang paling uh, ini Youth Research Camp ini sudah menjadi satu kurikulum di salah satu sekolah di YPAB, uh, di Bukota Bogor. Jadi setiap ujian praktek udah nggak ada ujian praktek. Hanya ikut program ini nilainya langsung dapat. Hari ini sedang berjalan juga. After mining, Velocity itu Fear Owl City. Jadi kita ngajak teman-teman untuk uh, lebih mengenal Back Heritage Discovery dan lain sebagainya. Ini adalah scoop yang sudah uh, kita lakukan. Ada yang masih ecotourism development, ada yang sudah bentuknya program development, sudah bisa dijual. Di ecotourism development itu ya dia baru punya data dan itu sorry mungkin ada di beberapa banyak desa wisata itu sudah dibuka, dibangun, punya nama, punya media, tapi ketika kita tanya layanannya apa dan bayar berapa, susah jawab. Gak punya, nggak uh, punya. Itu kami anggapnya masih di tahap development. Tapi kami membuat program sendiri, ada Eco Camp di Bogor, Bike Heritage, Youth Research Camp di Dieng Plateau, kemudian Live in Story and Trip in Tribe, kemudian ada After Mining, Eco Camp, dan ada banyak program lain yang belum kita masukkan. Saya akan cerita beberapa, yang pertama tentang Bike Heritage. 
Kenapa kita bikin Bike Heritage? Kalau teman-teman ada yang sudah sering main ke Bogor? Belum, serius? Oke, okay. deket kok cuma 2 jam naik KRL. <laughs> nanti ya, okay. sekarang kita punya koneksi ya. Jadi nanti kalau main ke Bogor, main. Dan sayangnya Bogor itu adalah satu kota, salah satu kota pusaka. Dia punya 25 site heritage yang sudah disahkan oleh menteri. Dan kemudian ulang tahun Bogor itu dari heritage, tapi tempat heritage ya, nggak ada yang tahu di mana, ceritanya apa, dan hanya jadikan evidence. Ketika kita datang ke disebut bar dan lain sebagainya, nggak tahu mas gimana cara jualnya. Akhirnya kita membuat sebuah program, kita membuat rundown, RAB, dan lain sebagainya, pengajuan, akhirnya sudah terjadi nih. Ini yang yang pertama adalah kita sudah membuat signing system. Jadi supaya tahu heritage site-nya ada di mana, Storytelling, uh, storytelling, storytelling, eh, telling, astagfirullah. Sorry, sorry, saya sangat nervous di sini. Nih. <laughs> Storytellingnya seperti apa? Kemudian kita bekerja sama dengan akademis lokal, uh, ada dari Universitas Ketatuan untuk melatih hospitality dan service teman-teman yang guide-guide pesepeda itu banyak. Tapi mereka kontribusi secara langsung apa? Nah, kita ajak, kita latih, kemudian menjadi guide-nya langsung. Kemudian kita juga ajak teman-teman UMKM, kita langsung kasih pasarnya, jadi ada wisatawan, mereka jualan. Kemudian kita juga, nah aktif uh, seniman-seniman ini yang konsepnya, apa ya dia, atraksi, itu jarang punya panggung, kecuali dapat orderan, betul ya? Nah, ini kita coba buat rutenya, dan itu setiap Sabtu Minggu dia akan manggung gitu. Meskipun kita bikin live. Yang terakhir kita sudah ikut pameran uh, apa namanya itu pameran metaverse di Singapura waktu itu diselenggarakan oleh Good City Foundation. Dan kami juga bilang ke banyak teman-teman wisatawan bahwa impactnya apa sih ikut Bike Heritage? Kami bilang ada hitungkan ketika bersepeda udah dapat berapa banyak kalori, kemudian reduce karbon berapa banyak, direct impact ekonominya berapa banyak. Itu co-creation yang kita coba buat supaya teman-teman ini bentuknya apresiasi untuk teman-teman yang udah bersepeda. Yang tadi yang enggak sepeda jadi sepeda. Dan kita sudah grab wisatawan uh, mancanegara dan hari ini yang paling susah adalah daftar ke Trip Advisor karena Trip Advisor jam 5 pagi ada order ya jam 6 jalan-jalan gitu. Nah, kita harus siapkan semuanya itu siap dulu gitu. Tapi karena konsepnya social entrepreneurship, kita harus benar-benar atuh ngajak semuanya itu ngerti konsep So, ini tuh bisnis gitu, ini bukan kolektif only gitu. Itu susah sekali. Oke, okay. ah ini main program kita, Youth Research Camp. Ini make, bagi saya ini membuat banyak impact bukan hanya untuk peserta, tapi untuk kawasan ya. Karena kami membawa teman-teman yang sekolah untuk mengimplementasikan uh, hasil belajar di sekolah dan kemudian menjadi problem solver di suatu kawasan. Kami bawa ke empat lokasi, dan ini 14 hari efektif liburannya. Hanya sekolah-sekolah khusus yang mau meluangkan waktunya. Kebetulan sudah jalan, kita ingin teman-teman siswa itu melakukan ini semuanya. Critical thinking, creativity, communication, dan lain sebagainya. Dan ini ada yang sudah dilakukan oleh teman-teman siswa. Jadi anak kelas 2 SMA udah bikin analisa vegetasi. Yang harusnya itu semester 5 di kehutanan, dan lain sebagainya. Dan hasilnya, oh ini total roadmap-nya. Nah, ini adalah yang dilap, yang menurut saya bagi kita selalu dapat alhamdulillah ucapan terima kasih dari kawasan. Kenapa? Kami membawa 300 orang siswa di luar guru, tim kita bisa 100 orang lebih untuk tinggal lima hari di Dieng. Sebanyak itu semuanya kita book, kemudian makan tiga kali, transportasi dan tempat wisata semuanya kita book. Kita nggak ada funding, jadi semuanya langsung masukin RAB, langsung tawarkan. Dan alhamdulillah ini tiap tahun. Ketika kita pingin pindah dari dia, orang dia selalu bilang, ayolah mas, pindah, jangan pindah dan lain sebagainya. Karena dia hanya punya season mungkin dia culture festival dan mungkin ini menjadi hal yang baru buat mereka. Ini adalah hasil output-output risetnya teman-teman YRC, anak kelas 2 SMA sudah buat seperti ini. Dan uh, pastinya YRC bukan langsung anak siswa biasa. Kita ada tutor-tutor juga yang sudah kita seleksi. Yang terakhir kalau bisa dilihat di Instagram Ekotiva, beberapa sudah S2 dan lain sebagainya. Oke, okay, di Levin kita skip aja. Ini juga sama, kalau tadi WRC satu homestay mungkin 10 orang Mas Bagus ya. Jadi mungkin 30 homestay. Kalau live-in, satu rumah itu dua orang. 
but bawa 300. Jadi satu desa kita blok. Jadi satu blok dan ada proses uh, yang paling penting adalah bagaimana membuat warga desa ini paham layanannya dan merasa worth it terus dibayar. Jadi yang susah adalah, mas saya harus ngasih harga berapa? Ketika mereka ada juga pasti, mas homestay saya 500 ribu, yang harus kita lakukan apa? Gak mungkin pindah kan? Kita akan kalau kami memilih bilang, ya waktu itu saya ke Pak Anggun ya begitu ya. Uh, Oke okay, 500 ribu setara seperti ini. Bapak harus mengikuti dan mempunyai kualifikasi ini dan fasilitas ini. Saya akan bantu dampingi untuk mewujudkan itu. Itu yang kita lakukan. Dan itu meningkat, dan betul, dan terjadi. Dan kita nggak apa-apa bayar 500 ribu. Dan ini adalah momen di mana after mining, waktu itu pertama 2017 kita baru tahu bahwa perencanaan destinasi kita itu bisa dapat hibah, dan jadi kita bisa lebih sepangat. Kenapa? Karena sebelumnya perencanaan destinasi yang kita lakukan, itu kita setengah-setengah. Kenapa setengah-setengah? Ya karena sederhana. Karena kita ada budget yang harus dijaga gitu. Selama kita berbuat lebih-lebih-lebih, budgetnya kita nggak akan dapat profit. Tapi dengan kita tahu bahwa ada after mining dan lain sebagainya, ada YCLI sudah memberikan dana untuk kita, jadi kita lel sangat leluas sekali, leluasa sekali membangun sebuah kawasan, sampai memiliki layanan, sampai memiliki local hero, sampai memiliki local genius. Dan hari ini seperti apa mereka? Ini prosesnya. Boleh dilihat di IG-nya Pesona Woncolo, mereka sudah punya kunjungan yang konsisten untuk wisata tambang. Terima kasih Waisili dan Ed Marika. Ini hari ini. Dan ini yang membuat kita jadi, oke okay, kita harus split panjang, kalau pengen buka kawasan ya Mas Bagus ya, kita harus latih dulu, kemudian baru mikirin cara jualnya gimana, itu proses yang panjang, tapi kita sangat menikmati. Dan mungkin, sorry juga teman-teman, mungkin kalau cari-cari kita nih ya, di pemasaran kita sangat kurang bagus sekali, karena sampai saat ini kami ya masih berangkat dari problem definition awal, masih survival instinct gitu. Karena kami merasakan kenapa melakukan ini semuanya ya karena the best marketing ever saya pikir ya care, cukup berempati, cukup perhatian itu bisa menjadi hal yang bagus. Dan sampai saat ini kami semuanya hidup karena testimonial gitu. Jadi banyak kesan baik dan kemudian hubungan baik dan akhirnya menjadi transaksi yang baik. Nah ini yang membuat bisnis kita itu stay sosial gitu. Jadi kadang ada istilah uh, bisnis doesn't care does, doesn't care with your feelings gitu. Bodo amat sama perasaan kita semuanya gitu kan. Bisnis ya udah langsung profit dan lain sebagainya gitu. Cuman testimonial ini yang kita kejar yang akhirnya membuat kita tetap stay sosial. Kita harus mikirin Bapak ini nggak apa-apa nggak uh, apa-apa ya. Kalau dibayar 100.000 dia ikhlas gak ya? Itu kita tanya. Ini yang membuat kita akhirnya testimonial dari partisipan, peserta, tamu Partners itu yang membuat kita masih ada di sini. Dan ini pentingnya, ini pentingnya di apa namanya social entrepreneurship yang pertama teman-teman tahu siapa kerjasamanya seperti apa dan kemudian perannya apa. Yang terakhir make it message-nya clear. Jangan ngomongin masalah sosial tapi kemudian nyari untung. Bilang ngomong aja mending nyari untung tapi ada manfaat sosial. Itu bisa jadi bahaya. Ini yang kita lakukan. Dan yang terakhir, ini adalah skills yang selama ini kami rasakan diperlukan. Problem so, uh, yang akhir-akhirnya ke negosiasi. Gimana semuanya tetap stay nyaman lah. Dan ini saya pikir ya, social entrepreneurship yang dibangun Ibu Teresa ke Anggun itu adalah suatu hal yang balance, tapi balance itu ya bukan suatu hal yang kita cari, tapi yang kita buat. Jadi kita harus buat itu. Yep, thank you. Terima kasih dari saya. Terima kasih Mas Afro. Thank you for the good presentation. Uh, before we continue, I would like to remind uh, those who are attending offline and also attending online that you can and you are free to ask our speakers today a question or even multiple questions regarding their presentation or of what they sh uh, already shared today through our comments and also th for those who are attending offline. You can just raise your hand later uh, uh, as we do our talk show or after for the Q&A session. So as we are going to head to our session now, you can prepare your questions. Feel free to do it in, uh, in Indonesia. Bisa ditanyakan uh, melalui bahasa Indonesia, nanti akan ditranslate pertanyaannya untuk our speakers, especially Dr. Teresa Shahin. Untuk pertanyaannya dan untuk pertanyaan untuk Mr. Sanggun dan Pak Afra, silahkan dipersiapkan dari sekarang ya. 
Oke, okay, uh, mungkin nanti kita, uh, jadi kita akan talk session dulu, nanti habis itu akan Q&A session. Thank you. Oke, okay, for now, uh, let us start with the talk show session. Uh, we already um, heard the presentation from all of three of you to, from today, so I have prepared some questions for us to be discussed today, especially regarding the social entrepreneurship from uh, everything that we have discussed earlier. For the first question, I've already prepared one for Teresa first, maybe. What trends do you see emerging in the field of social entrepreneurship and how do you see the role of social entrepreneurs evolving in the years to come? Okay, thank you for the question and for all your great work moderating and also to both speakers for your great talks and the audience for being here with us. I think one trend that I would like to talk about is something that I call extrapreneurship when, with my students. And this isn't really a word, it's just the trend that we're observing is that people are more and more finding new ways to work collectively beyond the boundaries of any one organization. So if entrepreneurship means starting something new and entrepreneurship means innovating within an existing institution, we're just using the word extrapreneurship to wrap our head around the concept of innovate, innovating beyond the boundaries of any one institution and finding ways to collectively be entrepreneurial. So an example of that is an initiative, it's not even an organization, a network called Catalyst 2030. So just like in my talk, I was saying we won't reach the Sustainable Development Goals until 2080 unless we accelerate progress towards the goals. So Catalyst 2030 is a network of people working in social entrepreneurship around the world who came together to accelerate progress towards the goals by finding ways to work together and to support each other's work. And they purposely did not register a new organization because that would just propagate the, um, the power dynamics and the flow of wealth from north to south. They just formed a distributed entity. It's not an organization. It's like a constellation of actors. And so they're just working together to try to create a social change where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And it's this type of collective action that I see as a trend. When social entrepreneurship first became popular at the turn of the millennium, maybe 20, 25 years ago, it was about the heropreneur, right? Like the entrepreneur who has a cape like Superman or Superwoman and is like flying in and saving the day. That was kind of what was desirable and now it's not anymore. It causes more harm than, than good, I think. It's really about um, collective action. And I'm happy to see this trend, and I hope it increases, and I encourage everyone here to take part in it. Thank you for your answer. So uh, I can kill it for that. It's more distributed now rather than uh, large companies or large uh, community making it, but more like people, like you say, a constellation of actions. Thank you, Teresa, for the answer. For the next one, I have one question for Mrs. Angun. For you, in your opinion, are there any particular industries or sectors that are seeing a lot of growth in social entrepreneurship in Indonesia? Okay, considering that we are comprises of, thank you for the questions. Yeah, considering that we comprises of more than 17,000 islands and so many tourist destinations just appear, I guess, in the industry of uh, agro-tourism, for example, in agribusinesses, as well as the e-fisheries. And the last one is the tourism industry, I guess, because it's really aligned with the government blueprint as well as the regulations. Okay, thank you. Um, you, you want to add something? So I think it's interesting that you're talking about agriculture and tourism because we have an example here yeah. of, of someone who's succeeding or, and working in the tourism sector. So maybe you're right. It would be great to hear if you agree or what you would have to say. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rafa, want to add something? Yeah. Uh, sebenarnya, ya kalau di wisata itu sudah sangat penting banget sih bahwa ada, wisata itu adalah suatu sektor yang multi multidisiplin dan multi dampak. Jadi sangat mudah sekali bahwa kita enter dari wisata dan kemudian menyelesaikan banyak masalah di social enterprise. Jadi ini 
sektor yang bagi saya sebenarnya cukup mudah seharusnya dan sebenarnya impact itu sebenarnya nggak usah nggak usah ditargetin karena teman-teman mau nggak mau ketika bikin sebuah bisnis mau nggak mau pasti buat impact dan harusnya suatu keharusan itu aja. That's a great point because then it, it kind of goes back to what we were saying about entrepreneurship like you don't even have to think one sector at a time it's about collaborating across sectors so how can tourism you're already impacting the education sector the environmental yes. sector yes like economic livelihood yes. so it's about being interdisciplinary yeah. i think just yeah. from the visiting this what uh, side we can touch many areas mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, this is the magic of the tourism. Well, um, it's interesting because uh, the next question, uh, of course, uh, headed towards Mr. Afro, is actually related to what we just talked about now. Uh, you can elaborate further about how you collaborate with local communities and stakeholders to avoid this. I think it's a hard point. How That's to, good she asked you that because at yeah. the end of your presentation you wanted to say more about it but you were running yeah, out of time yeah. so you had to skip through. <laughs> okay. So now you have a second okay, chance. Okay, okay. Uh, bekerja sama dengan stakeholder itu adalah poin yang sangat susah dan poin yang sangat uh, apa ya challenge. Yang poin yang pertama adalah yang penting adalah teman-teman tahu bahwa ketika ingin masuk teman-teman harus stakeholder mapping loh. Ada siapa saja yang berperan di dalam situ. Satu poin pertama dan perannya apa? Dan dampaknya apa? Kita harus tahu yang mana bahwa ini akan bisa menjadi dampak strategik buat kita atau ini dampak teknis atau ini hanya dampak sebagai seperti government. Itu fungsinya dia adalah legitimasi program kita keren. Jadi kita bisa apply sponsorship more. Government. Kita nggak bisa minta duit ke government. Akan ditolak. Pertama stakeholder mapping. Yang kedua adalah clear communication. Yang penting tuh komunikasinya jelas dan kemudian konsisten. Karena poin penting yang ketika kita coba menyampaikan social entrepreneurship program di dalam wisata. Bisa jadi, kita bisa jadi musuhnya nih. Seolah menobjektifikasikan si uh, lokasi. That's why yang paling, poin paling penting adalah sampaikan goals paling uh, utama dan itu make it consistent. Kita selalu membuat di setiap program kita, itu ada yang namanya storybook, traveler ideas, Explore book dan lain sebagainya. Itu isinya adalah handbook untuk tim kita dan kemudian untuk eksternal agar tahu message yang harus dilakukan seperti apa. Jadi role kerjasamanya itu di hal itu. Itu yang membuat kita uh, stay stable di, di komunikasi sampai saat ini dengan government pun seperti itu. Can I also add? Because suddenly it just come appear to my mind when we just first build the kampung wisata. Because um, I represent the academics as well as the NGO side. And then we need to also rearrange budget from the CSR. And we have to work with the local people. So it's always never been matched. So I kind of have a fight quite a lot with the CSR persons. Because I really wanted to represent what the local people want to do. Yeah, really like being independent of, uh, of what they think. Like, you know, like the idea should be like bottom up. But with the gov uh, with the uh, CSR is is really different because they're kind of multinational company, so the culture is not really Indonesian. They have several very strict stand standard of how to do even like the signs, the logo, or everything, the communications. They have to be like informed. So I think it's kind of a learning point for me. Yeah. So we need to like communicate clearly uh, with all the stakeholders as well as us the uh, local government. And that's a great point if we're going to talk about entrepreneurship and collaborating across sectors is like different players within and across sectors have different agendas. So how are you going to get everyone aligned and create value propositions for the different stakeholders? I think that's one of the greatest challenges and I think that collective action, the kind of collective action I'd like to see more of is building power for the grassroots. I'd like to see the grassroots, which you are both active in, drive the agenda so that the CSR needs to just get on board with that yeah. and, and they're building more power for the grassroots sector rather than this top-down ap approach where the funding flows from the private sector so that they're the ones that have the power. Okay. 
Thank you so much for another um, great point. I conclude that uh, the main challenge on um, establishing a connection with the stakeholders and also the well the um, advancers for the social entrepreneurship is uh, on the communicating part. That brings me to the next question. It will uh, I will ask Teresa for this. It it is somehow related to our previous question. Can you tell a story of failure instead in a social innovation project? The, the examples of failure that I've seen have been when it's an object and people think this object is going to make a difference. A lot of people, um, this heropreneurship uh, uh, mindset, when they think like, I'm going to invent something and it's going to change everything. Like... Um, I don't want to give specific examples because I, I feel bad for the entrepreneurs, but the failures happen when you get really, really married to the idea. Like you're so excited about this thing you created and it becomes like a hammer looking for a nail where your goal becomes making this object that you've created to succeed instead of like being married to the problem of like what is the best way to solve this problem? Even if you have a cool idea or a cool invention, it's not that that's your focus, it's the problem. That's what I mean by a hammer looking for a nail. You're like trying to make your idea succeed. When sometimes, as I mentioned in my talk, the idea has to evolve and iterate and change over time. And it's never one thing that's going to solve this problem. It's like mobilizing existing stakeholders and solutions. And if you do have an object or an idea that you've created, in order for it to succeed, it has to be focused on how can existing stakeholders work together better? How can we strengthen the existing system? That's when your idea or your object is going to provide value. And so when I was working with the PPM crew this week and doing a training of trainers, we talked about the difference when you're designing your idea and your offering, the difference between ha starting with an idea and saying, wouldn't it be cool if dot, 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 instead you want to start with the problem. Write the problem statement. What is it about the world I'd like to see different? And then think about what would it look like if this problem went away? What is the vision I have for a different world? And then start with the question, how might we, dot, 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 like how might we change this problem? Not, wouldn't it be cool if I did my idea? You want to add something or Mr. Afro? Yeah, any failure stories you'd like yeah. to share? Yeah, uh, betul. Uh, yang paling penting jangan terlalu euforia dengan ide yang kita punya itu betul. Kalau di setiap program yang kita desain itu punya problem pertama. Kalau by heritage pertanyaan cuma simple. Mau main ke Bogor, kemana dan ngapain? Jadi kita buat. Uh, di uh, YRC itu lebih kompleks. Tadi tur tadi. Ngapain aja. Akhirnya ya kita coba buat betul. Structure di YRC pun sama. Yang pertama teman-teman tuh harus punya problem definition, problem validation, Design solution and design validation for the solutionnya itu yang kita coba buat makanya biar semuanya aman aja sih. Jadi struktur itu penting ya dalam membuat itu. Oke, okay, thank you. Bisa sanggup? You wanna add oh yeah, I think so many failures that I met <laughs> personally or collectively. Okay, let's get comfortable. You, you, you can you can share that because the next question will be heading towards you. Is just uh, what's the most challenging part on your journey on developing Kampung Labirin? Okay, because at first I was kind of the had euphoria, you know, like I have some big picture and ideas that really cool to be implemented in these areas because we think that we've we've been knowing all the local people for eight years. So we were very like optimistic at that time. And we tried to, even though we already like done so many research assessments, I think I finished working at PPM at five, six, then I went back to Bogor and then talk with all the all the men, yeah, all the bapa bapa there until two AM, three AM in the morning. And then I continue doing that, research that, but still uh, I think I I had some ego at that time that that it will be really cool. We can do like A, B, C, D and the local people never buy it. They they will they won't say it they won't say it in in front of your face they was like oh that's a very nice idea but they never do it anymore <laughs> why not why not <laughs> because they think it doesn't match to what they need so 
product iteration like Teresa said is like something that we continue yeah. to do <laughs> because fail and then how to improve on that part how to improve on this part and we do it like all alongside along the way uh, we're progressing I think and one lesson we learned together last week when we visited Javara which is one of the social enterprises Angun mentioned is that the founder said that when you go talk to people, whether it's in a situation like Kampung Labyrinth or whether it's in one of the islands in Indonesia where they have these indigenous plants where Javara works, you don't go in with a specific idea. You will fail. That's an example of how to fail when you have an agenda and you are sure that your idea is how to solve this problem. You go with the only agenda of listening and learning. If you go with an open mind and without an agenda, and your purpose is to listen and learn, then you will find the ideas and the solution from the people you're working with. And that is the first step that you can take towards success. Mungkin tambahan, uh, ini soal failure ya. Kita banyak banget gagal. Yang pertama, miskomunikasi. Yang kedua, misekspektasi. Jadi uh, si sosial ini selalu berpikir kita adalah the angels selalu give everything dan akhirnya mungkin itu membuat dia nggak bergerak juga yeah. and dependent dependent yep. itu makanya poin yang paling penting adalah kita harus paham kita akan membagi beban atau peran kemudian harus menimbulkan sebuah kebanggaan dan keuntungan dan mungkin itu akan jadi suatu keberlanjutan poin pro, kita pernah problem dengan kru kita karena oh sorry banyaknya interaksi seperti yang dibilang Bu Teresa tadi terkait konsentrasi itu penting juga di social enterprise kita makanya harus tahu siapa siapanya ini dengan ini mungkin kita match tapi dengan ini apa sebenarnya si crew dengan masyarakat bisa jadi konflik itu pentingnya miskomunik apa ya kita concern di miskomunikasi dan misekspektasi oke okay, uh, since Mr. Alfred brought up uh, regarding the problem he faced on his own enterprises I would like to ask then how did you overcome the whole problem that you faced along the way <laughs> feel free to share by keep going <laughs> oke okay. uh, saya belajar ya Mas Bagus di mana setiap komunikasi miss itu oke okay, bisa gitu. Tapi yang penting apakah kita sudah punya feeder komunikasi dasarnya sudah cukup komplit apa belum? Itu yang harus kita evaluasi. Komunikasi kita cukup clear apa belum? Ketika terjadi pelanggaran, ketika itu masih bisa toleransi, kita toleransi aja Pak. Tapi kalau memang nggak bisa, ya mau nggak mau, kita harus standby dan tanggung jawab terhadap adanya konflik tersebut. Sorry, saya harus share mungkin ya Mas Bagus ya. Kita konflik sudah sampai parah banget terjadi di suatu desa ada sexual harassment di ke, antara ya beneficiaries dengan peserta kru dan lain sebagainya ada fraud itu sangat possible terjadi dan bagaimana kita ini ya kita standby kita siap bertanggung jawab and targetnya adalah good testimonials kesan baik kalau kita nggak dapat kesan baik dari program kita dapat kesan baik dari handling masalahnya itu yang paling penting. Add something? Yeah, I think that honesty and transparency and accountability are necessary ingredients for success, and lack of them are necessary ingredients for failure. And when I talk to social entrepreneurs that think they have all the answers and their ideas are perfect and their work is perfect, that's a red flag to me. Because nothing is perfect and nobody has all the answers. I think that communicating about your strengths is really important. And communicating about your weaknesses and limitations is really important. Because that's how you engage other stakeholders in helping you succeed. When people want to know how can we help make this better. So I think it's, it's the only thing you can do is be really honest about your failures as well as your successes and then other future social entrepreneurs also learn from you and don't have to repeat the same mistake. Okay, thank you so much. Well, uh, this is almost the end of our talk show session, but it would be um, it would be hard to miss to have one key point from each of you. So let me close our talk session with a question. What advice would you give to someone who is interested in starting an, a social enterprise and how can they best prepare themselves for this journey? Maybe from Mrs. Angud first. I think the, the best way is not to open your, starting your uh, social venture directly by yourself in the meantime, but I guess 
by involving in so many activities and in so many uh, institutions, organizations in which they can offer you so many roles, different ro roles. Maybe you will find what will what uh, what will you want to do uh, with the social ventures, and you have a clear head. Uh, is it is it really for me, or maybe you want also to participate in some organizations? I think that will be okay. It's like I think social entrepreneur is not is not for everyone. It's not for everyone. If you are really wanted to do it, let's do it. But first, I think you need to learn more by working in some in some institution or social ventures to get uh, clear ideas. So you have to filter it out through yourself first before deciding yeah. to step in inside the social enterprise. Thank you, Mrs. Angun. How about you, Dr. Teresa? I think that I'll I'll echo what Angun said and frame it slightly differently. So I do think that everyone can get involved in social entrepreneurship and collective action. So it is for everyone, but not everyone has to start something new. So my advice about how to get involved and how to get started is to get involved with the problem. Um, we call this apprenticing with the problem. Make sure that you actually find someone who's already working on this, find someone who's already experiencing this, and just get involved with them. Then after working for on it for a long time, it will emerge how you can add value. Or even if you already have an idea about how to add value, then start by working with people who are already on the front lines and test out your idea, not by announcing it and creating a new social media handle and a new company, but just like start doing the work on the ground. And then if it picks up and if it builds momentum, and if you have to start a new organization in order to implement it, then do that. But just be warned that a lot of the time, starting a new organization becomes its own thing. And you spend more than half your time on the organization itself instead of the work. So my advice is just find a way to do the work without creating a lot of noise around it and let the work speak for itself. <laughs> OK, thank you so much. So the aim is not to start an enterprise, but how you can help to solve exactly, the problem. how you can contribute to collective action. Okay. Perfectly put. <laughs> Thank you so much. How about you? Uh, yang pertama sebenarnya social enterprise itu adalah suatu hal yang menyenangkan. Dan yang kedua yang paling penting, menenangkan. Itu suatu hal yang Calming. susah didapat berda... Uh, dua. Yang dilakukan setelah... Saya mungkin menambahkan dari Bu Anggun dan Bu Teresa. Cukup tiga poin. Yang pertama adalah... Determinasi, ya kita punya tekad. Yang kedua konsentrasi. Yang ketiga adalah kesabaran. Be patient more. Itu akan membuahkan yang namanya dedication. Karena ketika kita udah punya dedikasi, semu semuanya terlihat mudah. Dan akan terlihat menyenangkan. Dan mungkin menenangkan. Itu aja. Poin yang sangat... Oh, I've never heard banget. someone use the word calming to yeah. describe social entrepreneurship or any entrepreneurship. It makes you relax. That's how you relax. <laughs> wow. I need to hang out with you more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for th the three of you for and for the audience. Um, you can start asking now. Um, it's the end of our talk uh, talk show session. So I'm opening the Q and A session. So can I see any raised hand? You want to ask? Can someone please provide a mic? Thank you. Hi, my name is Zari. I got two part question. First, but Mas, I suka presentasinya. I just want to give you a little bit of motivation. Banten and the area Wogor, it was a cosmopolitan of Asia in 1600s. Yeah. Uh, I can. I can. I can give you uh, uh, research on the data because you gotta when you when, when you create tourism you gotta create the, the main menu menunya apa utamanya kan gitu satu itu uh, major history the this it was a cosmopolitan Americans were there Chinese were there the Germans were there the Jews was in Banton everybody's it was a merchant uh, uh, Society and Krakatau, boom, nah, udah selesai. That's one. But uh, one thing that I think is good for Bogor is Curug. Yeah, in in Mexico, people go there for, for the cenotes. 
Senotes uh, tuh kayak apa ya? Nah, uh, it's like a water cave. I think curug because there's so many curugs in the area. That could be your main menu, perhaps. Well, for uh, this is not a pertanyaan, tapi pernyataan. Maaf. Yeah. <laughs> for uh, for, for uh, Teresa, um, I question myself what is social entrepreneurship since like maybe for 10 years. Yeah, I've done a lot of collective research and so on. But um, I think the most sustainable model is Wakaf. Wakaf, it's, a, it's an Islamic uh, model that's been established for hundreds of years. But uh, the West took Wakaf and it becomes a, uh, what we call today as a uh, T, uh, TTI Limited, Propriety Limited. The innovation came through because uh, Islamic civilization only kept Wakaf only for universities and you know um, farming models. But <clears throat> uh, the best Wakaf model is Pondok Kunduk, uh, the Silk Road, the Silk Road from 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 China to connecting to 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 Baghdad. And, and Medina and all that, uh, it's like a toll road for free, no payment. Can you, that's why the Arabs, they are so well, um, uh, they know how to cut costs, they know how to keep their margins because of their sustainable model. They kept the infrastructure for free. And I don't know how they did it, But uh, in Indonesia, kita terkenal namanya Pondok. But in, in the Funduk or Karavan Serai. Can you imagine being a trader? You can go, there, there, are, there are 15 Pondok, 15 points, 1500 points, I'm sorry. Um, and you can stay there for three days for free, including meals, water, and they, sec uh, they secure, it's, it's, it's safe to travel from A to To, to B, from B to, to from 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 Pondok A to another Pondok, and so forth. Um, I don't know if that relates, but but when I see the trend, the walk-off system is proven to be more sustainable. I'm not saying the best, but uh, I don't know if you have. I've, this is the this is the question. Have you ever compared the walk-off system within your you know, university as part of your research or study? Thank you. I would, uh, thank you for the question. I would frame this system um, within the general context of philanthropy. So this is a form of philanthropy, right? Like having free accommodations, free roads. Um, in the US, for example, um, they made free um, libraries, free public gardens, free museums. So I do think that philanthropy is very important. Um, I don't know if it's sustainable because philanthropy relies on high net worth individuals donating their money. Um, and so in order to get high net worth individuals, by definition, you, you might end up with low net worth individuals. And so it's one thing for high income people to donate money through philanthropy and create um, ways to help low income people and others. It's another thing to really question the system that created these disparities in wealth so that people don't have access to accommodation and roads and museums and libraries and public gardens and think about how can we find, um, how can we identify this inherent but uh, inherently stable, but um, unjust equilibrium, and try to think about how we can create a new and more just equilibrium. So how can we increase people's livelihoods, uh, decrease disparities in wealth? So I think philanthropy is important and always will be, because sometimes we just have to help people. But then I think social entrepreneurship takes it a step further by creating 
new systems and new ways for people to thrive instead of needing to be recipients of philanthropy. So that's how I think about it. And I've done a lot of work in venture philanthropy, which is when instead of creating something new that people can use, you find grassroots leaders and lived experience leaders who are solving problems and uh, achieving results, and you invest in them to help them scale and sustain their um, ventures and initiatives. So it's like a form of philanthropy that invests in people and social entrepreneurs. So that's one way to take philanthropy and push it one step further to engage with social entrepreneurship. Okay. Uh, pernyataan tadi malah justru memang betul, Mas. Itu menambah jumlah problem yang kita create. Uh, saya perlu perjelas Big Heritage itu skupnya adalah kota Bogor. The first thing, kota Bogor nggak punya curug, Mas. Jadi problemnya adalah Bogor hanya selalu menjadi kota lewatan. Ke puncak, pulang, kita nggak dapat apa-apa. Padahal di beberapa tempat itu ada namanya ecotourism gateway. Sebelum ke tempat itu datang dulu, dia nginep, dikasih overing activity, baru dia jalan ke tempatnya. Nah itu yang kita coba buat. Jadi konsepnya dia mungkin habis landing, dia mungkin kecuruk nih. Besok aktivitasnya apa? Gak ada. Nah ini adalah hanya aktivitas yang aktif di pagi, sore, dan malam. Bisa dipilih. That's why ini menjadi opsi yang kita berikan ke hotel, homestay, dan lain sebagainya. Karena hanya biasa diakses dalam waktu hanya 2-3 jam. Dan preferensi teman-teman di Eropa itu senang banget sepedahan. Jadi itu yang coba kita tangkap tuh. Karena ya permasalahan kota Bogor itu nggak punya curug sebenarnya. Nggak punya apa-apa dia. Dia punyanya cuma heritage dan saya pikir ada banyak lokal genius, kreator-kreator sandal yang beda sama lokal heroes. Lokal heroes tuh speaking. Tapi kalau lokal genius, dia dia bikin kujang di rumah mas. Jadi mau nggak mau kita datengin. Itu yang kita buat. Maka kita ada satu seri namanya lokal genius. Kita datengin langsung. Dan itu nggak bisa datengin di bis. Mau nggak mau sedikit-sedikit. Nah itu yang kita coba buat. Dan ya butuh marshal, butuh guide, butuh kerjasama dengan DLL AJ untuk keamanan. Itu yang coba kita lakukan. Karena memang Bogor nggak punya banyak opsi kecuali kebun raya. <laughs> gitu yang coba kita buat. Terima kasih. Ya kalau all of Bogor, uh, kita sudah punya banyak paket di Trip Advisor. Bukan jadi sebuah masalah lagi. Uh, tapi di kota Bogor sendiri itu yang jadi masalah. Sekarang 9 juta dat, uh, pengunjung yang datang ke kota Bogor itu hanya lewat dan hanya dinikmati oleh pengguna hotel, kafe, restoran. Gak ada lagi. Kita nggak ikut, nggak ikut kenapa-napa nih, gitu. Gitu kira-kira. Itu yang coba kita buat. Terima kasih. Okay. Thank you for the question. I would like to uh, ask from more of our audience. Anyone? Okay. Please. There are two more. Maybe two or three more questions. Okay. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Please introduce you, yourself first. Uh, my name is Arengawan Ismail. Uh, I have a question related to Jafar because you mentioned uh, one of my favorite tea. <laughs> uh, and I just found out that it's uh, for a uh, social entrepreneur. Uh, in base of my knowledge, uh, usually in Indonesia, uh, uh, in agriculture, usually uh, there's a farmer. Between farmer and uh, market, there's a middleman. Usually the middleman buy uh, agricultural goods in a large quantity, but in a very, very uh, low price, which uh, it, uh, it's very, uh, how to say it? Uh, I think it's easier to explain yeah. in Indonesia. It's okay. Yeah, okay. It's okay. Uh, I'm happy to gini, Ketika ada middleman, ada orang tengkulak di di tengah-tengahnya, itu kan berarti merugikan petani ya. Dan itu sebenarnya udah agak lumrah gitu. Itu udah ada sistemnya, yang sistem yang rusak. Dan Jafara di dalam hal ini uh, masuk dan membuat sistem baru. Pasti kan ada penolakan ya dalam orang yang dalam bekerja di sistem yang lama ya. Nah, uh, dari Anda bertiga, uh, ketika ada orang yang seperti kayak, uh, yang dari sistem yang lama yang rusak, Anda uh, mentekelnya gimana ya? Orang-orang yang kayak gini, kayak apakah kita harus kolaborasi atau 
uh, ya udah biarin aja mereka kayak gitu atau bagaimana gitu oke okay. karena Arenga jawab tanyanya bahasa Indonesia aku jawab jawab pakai bahasa Indonesia ya terima kasih Arenga atas pertanyaannya jadi uh, udah sangat apa ya common banget di Indonesia we have middleman tengkulak ya dan apakah uh, pernah saya research dan ngobrol-ngobrol dengan uh, teman-teman dari e-commerce ternyata ada lima tahapan saat kita membeli bawang atau telur jadi yang dirugikan bukan cuma petaninya petani dibayar dengan harga murah konsumen harus bayar dengan harga mahal karena harganya sudah berlapis-lapis jadi itu definitely yang merugikan yang merugi yang terkena rugi adalah kita sebagai konsumen dan juga si petani gitu ya nah maka dari itu se- sebelum selain Javara saya kenal beberapa e-commerce social enterprise yang mereka coba break uh, the chain gitu ya salah satunya 5 kilo tapi 5 kilo sekarang kengkong alsa sudah dijual ke dan juga Aruna Aruna itu ikan jadi nelayan gitu jadi mereka langsung kerja langsung dengan si farmer atau nggak dengan nelayan untuk mereka langsung jual lagi gitu ya jadi mereka motong sekitar 3 4 supply chain nah ketika mereka mencoba itu itu sulit sekali jadi memang tadi ke Afro bilang butuh dedikasi butuh konsentrasi karena susah kenapa middleman ini bukan hanya menguasai farmer tapi mereka menguasai pasar induk jadi mereka menguasai pasar induk dan bukan cuma menguasai pasar induk ya kadang beberapanya juga e, dimasuki sama beberapa organisasi keagaman atau politik jadi a little bit complicated bukan a little bit complicated ya very complicated jadi Mereka akhirnya uh, kolaborasi sama yang benar-benar di remote area gitu. Jadi yang benar-benar ya mereka tetap punya pilihan gitu. Mereka tetap punya pilihan. Mereka bisa tetap kerja dengan tengkulak, tapi in the meantime mereka juga bisa kerja dengan si uh, e-commerce yang bersangkutan gitu, dengan social enterprise yang bersangkutan. Karena biasanya kalau small holder uh, small holder farm, farm farmers, sorry, itu biasanya mereka memang nggak uh, semuanya bisa jual sampai puluhan kilo. Jadi 2 kilo, 5 kilo Jafar itu terima. Mereka terima semua jenis uh, petani, tinggal mereka nanti calculate. Kalau yang 2 sampai 5 kilo, mereka akan jual melalui channel A. Kalau yang bisa di atas 5 kilo, 15 kilo, 20 kilo, mereka akan jual ke channel B. Jadi itu masih struggling sih. Jadi sampai sekarang untuk memotong supply chain itu masih harus kolaborasi uh, multi stakeholders itu mungkin. Oke, okay. okay, thank you, Mrs. Anggun. Thank you, Arenga, for the question. We shall move to the next person. Please provide the mic. Introduce yourself and where you're from. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Inda, and my question is, how do you see the field of social entrepreneurship evolving in the coming years, and what opportunities and challenges do you anticipate? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this question. I, I see the field of social entrepreneurship as evolving in many ways. The first way is what we mentioned before in terms of new trends of collective action and extrapreneurship. And the second trend that I see is blurring the lines or even erasing the lines, hopefully, between social entrepreneurship and socially responsible business or even socially responsible citizenship. And What I'm trying to say is that there's so many ways to create social change, and social entrepreneurs are people who dedicate their lives to doing that. But the way I see it evolving in the future is that there will be a role, there already is a role, but there will be more people in existing jobs who don't self-identify as social entrepreneurs. But you could just be working in a bank or a university or a mall or whatever, and you find ways to job craft to innovate within your ex- uh, everything is covered by Teresa. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much once again for our speakers and one last um, you have to fill our feedback. Um, please help me uh, for the QR code. So there is this feedback QR uh, as a token of our appreciation. We would like you to offer you an e-certificate for your uh, participation and if you have completed this feedback form You will receive an e-certificate via email within the next 20 days. Okay, we will wait. Uh, we're closing. Okay, um, thank you all again for attending today's lecture on creating social impact. As we have seen, there are many ways to create positive change in our communities and the world at large. 
From individual actions to collective efforts, every one of us can make a difference. I want to encourage you also to reflect on what you can do to create social impact in your own life, whether it's volunteering, supporting a cause you believe in, or simply making conscious choices in your everyday life. Your actions can have a ripple effect that extends far beyond yourself. Thank you. Uh, cool. <laughs> I hope that this lecture has provided you with some ideas and inspiration for creating social impact in your own way. Let's continue work together to create a brighter, more just, and more equitable future for all. Thank you again for attending, and I wish all of you the best in your own effort Thank to make a positive much. difference. Thank, Thank you, you Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Mr. Opro. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for coming to today's event. And I would like to thank our speakers also for today for sharing your insight. And I hope it is informative for everyone. And earlier before this event, I asked a little pop quiz, which was true or false. The main aim of social entrepreneurship is to maximize profit for owners or shareholders. And the answer is false. The aim is to have a social impact more than maximizing profit for owners. And congratulations to Sam Winterian from YouTube for answering the question correctly. And if you enjoyed today's event, I would like to suggest you to go to our social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at AT America. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel and newsletter as well. And with that, I think we have reached the end of today's event. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And see you at the next At America event.